Ryan, thanks so much. Thanks, Green Invaders, for having us. Uh, as you mentioned, terrific panel here. I couldn't imagine three more um, honest veterans for the sports betting world uh, to have this discussion. So I think it might be helpful for maybe Sarah, Ray, and Scott to give a little bit of day-to-day -day kind of their roles and responsibilities at their organizations, and then we'll, we'll jump in from there. Sarah, if you'd like to start. Sure. sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Crennan. I oversee content for Yahoo Sports. Um, and have been deeply partnered with both BetMGM and the NBA for the past, uh, you know, 16 months plus. Thank you, Sarah. How about you, Ray? Yeah, thank you so much, Derek. And um, it's a fantastic event. Rim Doyle is my name. I'm VP of Marketing and Brand for BetMGM. So work very closely with, with Sarah and Scott. Um, I'm about, well, 15 years in the sports betting world, as you can tell from the accent. It's not the US or Jersey City accent. Um, so I moved across two years ago from, um, again, most of my life in the, in the UK or European sports betting world. So looking forward to talking a bit more about that. Great, thank you, Ray. And Scott? Uh, I'm Scott Kaufman-Ross, um, Senior Vice President and Head of Gaming and New Business Ventures for the NBA. I've uh, been at the NBA for about 10 years and for the last four have overseen a group that focuses on uh, commercializing the, the league's efforts in fantasy sports and sports betting. Um, and we also set the league strategy, everything from participating in regulatory discussions in the various states to advising our teams and our broadcasters on how to integrate sports betting, um, as well as how to, how to integrate sports betting into our digital products and into our telecasts. So uh, my group is in charge of uh, leading the NBA's charge into sports betting. Okay, great. Thank you for that, panelists. So let's go back in time, May 14, 2018. Supreme Court strikes down a ruling that had been in place since 1992 to allow states on their own to allow legalized sports betting on a state-by-state -state basis. If you could each talk a little bit about what that meant for you professionally and your organizations with that, with that significant change, and if anything, starting up a, a new industry, if you will, overnight. I can go first. Uh, thanks, Derek. So uh, I'll start with, uh, you know, Yahoo Sports has long time been a leader in just sports media coverage and, and covering the news cycle, as well as strength in fantasy. We have a, a ton of brand affinity around our Yahoo fantasy platform. And so, you know, the starting point for us was let's take our competitive advantages and let's explore the range of partnership possibilities. And um, I feel like there were a flurry of conversations they happened very, very quickly. And we slowly narrowed down the opportunity um, with BetMGM, which also includes, you know, an in-venue and on-site um, resort credit for some of our uh, activations and live events, which we thought was pretty compelling. Um, so, you know, it was, it was fast and furious, but also, um, I think, really eye-opening for everyone on the Yahoo Sports side of things. And then for me, personally, and from a career standpoint, like, I feel like I became a student again. You know, the most I had actually bet was I used to bet on, you know, my friend, you know, we'd have friendly bets of, about uh, college basketball, you know, when I was growing up, just because I'm such a big fan, but there was a whole, um, it was kind of a whole new vertical for me in terms of learning. Uh, and so I think from a career standpoint, it presented the opportunity to become a student again, to be frank, like this wasn't something where when I was kind of thinking about my career five years ago, I said, hey, I want to make sure betting is a part of it or creating betting content um, or going deeper into this vertical is a part of it. I think uh, I feel fortunate to have been in the right time to realize the opportunity that um, we now have in front of us as a sports media platform. And Ray, how about your world? Obviously a big change as well from three years ago. Yeah, my God, it's been a, a dramatic change, both professionally and personally. I think it, it was really fascinating for me, obviously, as I said, coming from the European side of the UK side of it, waiting, monitoring the situation for years and years and years. And candidly, it was um, very strange for you know the UK or the European market could bet on so many of the US sports. You talk about you know the NBA finals and Super Bowl and everything and anything when it came to US sports, yet people here in the US couldn't place a legalized sports bet. So we were always wondering is it is it a matter of time? Is it when is it going to happen? If it's going to happen and then in what form. So as you alluded to Derek, if New Jersey are the first state to take the the leap here and how else how will it unfold in terms of state by state? 
So it really was interesting, number one, to see once it finally was announced, then what would the next steps be? Who would be the first brand? How many of the, the heavyweights of the world gaming or the European superweights, like you, know, you talk about be win ourselves or Labrus Carl is, is my background. How would that come into the US market? You talk about Bet365 or, or Betfair, Skybet, Paddy Power, or they come in with some really fancy competitors. So it was really interesting to see how that would evolve. And, you know, regular hitters play such a key role that I'm sure we'll talk about. But how, how will this start to open up in terms of legalizing sports betting or, you know, iGaming? And then will it be very much a copy and paste element that it was for the European and the UK side of things? So, and then personally, um, it's been it's been absolutely, you know, it's an incredible roller coaster of a ride. Um, you saw COVID on top of that, and it's it's been just something else. But um, Matt Prevo, who's our, our chief revenue officer, I worked with him working for Labrooks and Coral, who are two brands in the UK market as part of the Entain wider brand. And he called me in, in January 2019 and asked me to change my life all over again and come to the US. So I didn't have to take too long to uh, to say yes and when can I start immediately, please. But uh, it's been an incredible journey. It really has, you know, launching the BetMGM brand, which didn't exist two years ago. So I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about the experiences for, you know, the UK versus the, the US market. But it's uh, it's been an incredible journey, and I, I really do feel it's it's still just getting started. Even though, as you alluded to, um, Derek, it's it's four years, well, it's three four years now, but there's we're still very much in our infancy. And Scott, in a lot of ways, the NBA was one of the most progressive as a league to endorse and accept sports betting. What's your perspective on that, and and kind of how things changed for you in the league at that point? Sure. Well, I remember the day very well. Um, we were very involved in the legislative process and. I remember there's actually a website called sconisblog.com where every Tuesday they post the Supreme Court cases and they don't tell you what day they're going to post the, the, the cases. So every Tuesday at 9 a.m. we were frantically hitting refresh to see whether or not uh, it, it had been the sports betting case and then, and then finally it was. Um, but, but yeah, to your point, Derek, it, it was the culmination of, uh, of a, a real journey for the NBA in terms of our position on sports betting. In the, in the early 90s, the NBA was a proponent of PASPA, the federal law that prohibited um, the states from legalizing sports betting. And the reason for that is in the early 90s, we felt the best way to protect the integrity of our games was a prohibition on sports betting. There are risks to our games. And in the early 90s, the, er the best way to do that was just a prohibition. But over the next 30 years, um, what happened with the advent of the internet and the smartphone, it just became so easy to bet on sports illegally. And what we saw was that prohibition was not serving to stop people from betting on sports. It was just encouraging them to do it illegally, either offshore or with their local bookie. And in 2014, uh, our commissioner, Adam Silver, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that formally changed the league's position on sports betting. He said, we are supportive of sports betting. We think the Congress should pass a law that legalizes sports betting on a federal basis and so that we can have legalized sports betting that's regulated where there's transparency um, and we bring sports betting from the underground black market into the sunlight where it can be monitored, taxed, and regulated. And, you know, that was a, a big change in the sports landscape and we were the first league to do so. And we spent the next three or four years um, preparing for a world where sports betting would be legal. Now we had hoped Congress would pass a law that, that had a federal framework that states could then opt into so that there was consistency. We didn't necessarily predict that they would overturn the, the, the previous law and just make it unconstitutional, allow states to do um, whatever they so pleased. But of course that was the way that unfolded and we needed to prepare for that. So we spent the first half of 2018 um, starting to talk to state legislatures and let them know that we were supportive of sports betting, um, but this is how we wanted it rolled out. And this is a framework that would protect leagues and give us the tools to help us protect the integrity of our game and protect our business interests as well. So we were, you know, we were ready uh, when that day came, we were supportive, we were waiting for it. And, you know, for me personally, I had spent the last four years, you know, no pun intended, betting my career on this category. Um, and so it was certainly a big day for me and my team that, um, what we had been building towards and what we had been preparing for was now real, and we were able to hit the ground running and, and begin to build this business over the last three years. 
Thank you for that background. I think as you had all touched upon this role that um, ever increasing importance on content around sports betting. And I wonder maybe how much you guys all collaborate as your brands and leading your brands in this space. You guys had mentioned earlier uh, when we caught up uh, this morning about sort of the interesting uh, new content being developed, these alternate feeds around sports betting. Maybe we can start with you, Sarah, obviously, and then go to, to Scott and, and Ray, how that's kind of evolved in, in your delivery of content to the consumer around sports betting. Sure, yeah. So. Uh... You know, I obviously have a keen understanding for the consumption habits of our users, both historically and, and for the recent NBA season, um, just around core NBA coverage. But really that that uh, that volume of engagement acts as a top of the funnel for how we ultimately drive deeper investment and deeper interest into gaming. And that's where, you know, partnering with Ray and BetMGM to understand like, Hey, what is the right time to introduce a promo? What is the right window or, or you know, the right hour relative to a game start that we can help, you know, publish a repeatable format and um, really understand the mentality of a better and what their need state is in any given moment across our platform. So I think, you know, it's been enlightening. Um, even just comparing last NBA season to this NBA season, we're up 30% in both daily, weekly, and monthly users um, as far as our NBA audience goes. Um, and you know, we've been able to extend you know, our partnerships in, in really interesting ways whereby uh, we've partnered with Scott and team for the NBA bet stream where we had a betting call and betting analysis alongside some of the NBA League Pass games, which was sponsored by BetMGM. And I think um, there are some really positive outcomes that came out of that. Um, notably, like the games that had, you know, a, a bigger points difference or were, you know, a notable blowout, like there was an, an, still a reason to engage, still a reason for uh, a fan who may be interested in betting to continue to watch and and for us to kind of bring value with our analysis and commentary. So, um, you know, we've we've learned a lot in through our partnership, and I think uh, exploring the content space has been really interesting and enlightening for us as a brand. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add to that, you know. NBA VetStream is part of a broader initiative we have at the NBA around the next generation of the telecast. And, and we have a view that um, you know, the way that our games have been presented, the way that the sports broadcast have been presented, have not really changed a lot over the last few years. And you know, with the new way that in the digital age, younger fans and digital savvy fans are looking to consume content, they want personalized experiences. They're, they're not looking for the same telecast that appeals to all fans alike. They want something that's a little bit more tailored to them. And we have been rolling out a, a series of initiatives, whether they're utilizing influencers or different graphics packages or alternate language, um, alternate angles to games. Um, TNT had a players only broadcast, bringing different perspectives to different fans and how they consume the game. And betting was a natural segmentation to do that. We, we know there's a lot of our fans that are utilizing sports betting and fantasy sports as a mechanism to engage with the NBA. And so to be able to deliver them a telecast that's directly targeted at them, you know, when they're watching the game, they're thinking about what does this mean for the live line? What does this mean for the over-under? Is my first half, you know, total going to hit? Those are the types of things that that type of fan is thinking about. And so serving them with tailored commentary tailored graphics package, interactive features that meets their viewing experience is the way that we're going to grow engagement around our game. And so it was a great way to bring both Sarah and the, and the Yahoo team, both lending talent as well as their production crew and incredibly helpful to helping us produce the games, whether it's graphics packages or thinking about different things to hit on throughout the game. And then Ray and his team being the sponsor of it and serving up markets that, that we discussed in the game. And, specialized promotion specifically for that game to be able to offer, again, a, a customized experience to the better. So it's something we launched uh, during, the uh, during the bubble in, in Orlando and continued last year and something we absolutely intend to do moving forward. And to that point, you touched upon it earlier, Ray, you have this great yeah. perspective on kind of more mature markets in Europe where sports betting has been more accepted for a long period of time. What observations or insights are you seeing relative to consumption patterns and activity 
as the U.S. kind of becomes a maturing market, if you will, in the sports betting landscape? Yeah, I think um, it, if I take a step back to two years ago and what, if I speak for BetMGM personally, what our products look like um, to where it is today, it really is night and day. It, it, we've we've taken what it was probably a two or three out of 10, we've moved to a 10 out of 10 now. And, you know, as Scott was alluding to, lots of our content is now is personalized to, to the consumer. So if you're in Indiana, we'll give you a Pacers offer or you've acquired because of the Pacers offer. If you're in Colorado, it'll be the Nuggets um, that you've acquired from. It could be through Yahoo as well. So what we're really trying to do is when you're in Colorado and you see our app or in Indiana, you're going to see two very different things. And we're trying to make it as personalized to you and as targeted to you because if you're not interested in, in other sports, then you're simply, you know, we don't, we don't really want to put that in our front, uh, front of house. So we're getting much better at that personalized content to you. And, you know, we have, we can take you through the, let's say an NFL Sunday or NBA playoffs. Um, we're actually bringing you through a few places to bet, which we know, we know you're engaged in that. And we can give you, as Scott was alluded to, offers or promotions that cater to that. Um, I, I really do think, as I mentioned about the product that we have, it's, it's each and every day the US market is catching up quite aggressively with that UK or European market. I, I think probably two years ago, the US consumer would be very satisfied by just having who's gonna win the game or if there's a traditional six pack. What we and what we've incorporated into that is giving them just many, many more opportunities to place an, an interesting bet. So if you think about Lakers versus Knicks, instead of just backing the Lakers to win the game, then how about use one of our, our product features called One Game Parlay, which gives you the option to make it a lot more compelling and interesting. So if you want to back LeBron James to score over 25 points, Anthony Davis to have eight or more assists and the Lakers to cover the spread, you can build that bet for yourself. So it's much more engaging, much more compelling to the consumer. And that's taken the, the, the knowledge that we know from using the NBA IP, address, IP uh, footage as well as taking the data we have from Yahoo. So compiling that all really gives that rich, engaging sports book experience and not just a, you place a bet before the game and you let it ride. It really is giving that opportunity to, to, to be engaged in your bet throughout. And if you want to you know, place another bet or, or cash out, you have the option with, with BetMGM. And that would seem to dovetail nicely. You, you guys at all point out you're seeing a, a greater and greater uptake of the handle of people betting during the games themselves on those that bets are allowed. So it would suggest there's still a lot of demand out there for these types of new products and abilities to bet in games that, that before were not open to the, to the consumer. So um, I'm going to throw this up for the group. Um, let's say you're a governor of a state that has not yet approved sports betting. Um, what would you instill? What are you seeing best in class to make it the most ease and best for the consumer, best for the state in terms of generating um, you know, tax revenues, but also making it compelling for the consumer to participate in that activity? Um, I'm happy to take that one, um, or at least a, a first pass. You know, we have been active at state level, uh, meeting with legislators, um, you know, for, for over three years now. And, you know, certainly the league has a set of priorities that, that we feel are important. And, you know, Ray and his team at BetMGM may have similar ones, some that we may disagree with, but I think for the most part, we, we agree on, on just about everything. You know, for us, I think the most important thing is that we have a competitive mobile market, um, you know, and a, you're not going to successfully bring out the offshore market. You're not going to bring the black market into the sunlight if you force people to drive three hours to their nearest casino to place the bet in a physical location. Um, they will just continue to bet illegally. And so in order to successfully have a, a, a vibrant sports betting market that's safe, that's robust, that generates tax revenue, that is a good experience for our fans, you have to have mobile sports betting and you have to have a competitive environment, having a, a monopoly for only one operator where there's no innovation around product, around marketing, around pricing of odds. Um, we think the most important thing for a robust sports betting market is a competitive mobile market. Then I think specifically for the leagues, you know, we there's a couple other things we look for. One is help in our um, efforts to protect the integrity of our games. You know, the, the reason that we were supportive of a regulated market was that in a transparent market, we are given the tools to help monitor suspicious betting patterns. And we're in a better position to protect the integrity of our games in a transparent market than in something that's happened offshore. But in order for that to work, we need to get the tools, the information, the collaboration to access those things. So we ask in the legislation that there be 
um, requirements to work with the league to do some of this integrity monitoring. And, and generally that's gone pretty well together with the operators. And then for us, the last thing that we look for is a requirement to use uh, official league data. Um, it's our view that if you're going to have regulated sports betting, um, our fans should know that those bets are being priced and settled using the actual official statistics of the league and not, you know, tabulated by some third party who's, um, you know, off in a room somewhere watching the game or, or sneaking into our game and doing it on their phones. It, it should be the actual statistics from the league that determine, you know, who wins and loses a bet and what the price should be for the bet. And that becomes even more important in a world with in-play betting. You know, as you mentioned, people are betting during the live game. And our game is incredibly fast paced. We have, you know, hundreds of changes in score. You know, we have a, a very fast paced nature of our game right now. So if you're 30 seconds delayed with your data feed, you could miss four plays. So ensuring you have that real time accurate data feed is essential for sports betting and incredibly essential for real time. Betting. So those are the things that we generally look for. And we, we uh, advocate to legislators that they should include in bills when they legalize sports betting. Um, but Ray or Sarah, you guys may have some additional things that are important to operators and, and content. Yeah, Scott, I think you stumbled up brilliantly this hour when you talk about um, it's the speed and ease that you're trying to give to a consumer to, to, to make it as easy as possible for them to set up an account or actually place a bet. And when we talk to our, our various regulars in various states, and they do differ quite dramatically from one state to the other, what is a breath of fresh air from us as an operator is we can have kind of candid conversations, we can actually come and say, at the Scots point, here's the best in class way of doing it. And here's the reason why it's beneficial to not only us, but also to you um, from a tax generating point of view. Those conversations, once we come off the call, we're like, yes, we, we have a good, we have a, inverted commas, a great state here that we can work with. You know, states where when we run lots and lots of promotions, as you can probably appreciate, as do a lot of our competitors, of course, and to be in a, the ability where we can we can work with a regulator on a more seamless way so the regulator doesn't have to approve every promotion we run, then all of a sudden it becomes a block to not only us, to the, to the state itself, but the consumer um, at, the, at the end of the day. So once we're having those conversations at the start, it's best to, to really do have that conversation of what is best in class and how close can we get to that? And so it does make sense for both us, the operator, and the state regulator as well. And as, as this gets more and more mature, we absolutely are starting to see that with various states where they go, they look at the New Jersey of this world, the Michigans of this world, and seeing what's, what's clearly has worked um, from these states and other states where it's a bit more challenging or a bit more you know, unique, if you like, uh, to Scott's point, then we kind of try and steer them in their way. And it's, it's not just for our own benefit, it really is for the consumer and to drive more tax dollars for the state itself. Yeah, we as a, um, you know, we as a brand, the, the foundation of our brand has been, as it relates to the Yahoo Sportsbook and our content has been built around education and trust. And I think that's incredibly important for, for legislation and as states come online, just thinking about how they will educate and how they will market um, what the opportunity is for their constituents. The second piece um, which falls into Ray's world is like the quality of the promo. What are the products that you're putting in front um, you know, of these fans are in front of this addressable market. Um, and then the last piece is just ease of access. Like how, how, how challenging is it for, uh, your market to, to ultimately bet? There are different rules on a, on a state by state basis that make, um, that make it a bit confusing at times, but the way I think about it is in that three-step process and, for our part of it, um, you know, as it relates to legislation, the easier we can explain it, the easier it is to tell, you know, uh, your constituents how to bet. I think the the greater success they'll have. Um, and you know, we've we've spent a lot of time thinking about that and making sure that as we're trying to, uh, you know, allow our audience to find value or come up with their own opinions around betting that we're continuing to infuse the educational piece as well. You, you've all brought up good points about the importance of safeguarding data, the integrity of the game um, as important steps to have the legalization of sports betting. That to me also speaks to the fact that another important aspect of the way it made increase fan engagement with sport. What are the demos of the people you are seeing that are participating in sports betting? Is it younger? Is it, is it more diverse? You know, we know that's been a challenge for a lot of team sports historically in the U.S. How do they reach younger audiences? Is it helping address 
that audience by allowing sports betting to be accepted within within their sports. Yeah, I can kick it off, Derek. Um, as you can probably appreciate, our, our demographic is quite broad. It's quite wide. You know, you're going from 21 all the way up and um, across male and female. It is dominant. It's you know, skewed more towards male, a slightly older um, demographic. It, and it can differ where you have such a, a different type of a consumer, a different type of, of a sports better, one that candidly is only interested in placing a $10 parlay on an NBA list of games. So you, we, we need to make sure we're catering for that type of customer, as well as someone who's probably a bit, feels they're a bit more savvy about the sports betting world, that they're really interested in the day-to-day -day aspect of sports betting. And what we do is, is very much try and cater for both. I think Sarah made a great, great point around the, the educational element and the entertainment element of what sports betting is. But that educational element is, is really key for me. So again, I reference the UK market because betting was really the fabric of the culture here in the US because it simply wasn't allowed in terms of legalized sports betting. I'm very conscious of when people come onto our app and researchers tell us it can be quite intimidating to see lots of these numbers in front of you. And when you just want to back LeBron James uh, to score 25 points, how can we as the operator make that as easy as possible for you? So we're constantly listening to our customers with, with VOC data and putting what they want in front of them as quickly as we can. So even when they see the six pack, that can be quite intimidating when you see money line spreads or overs, overs or unders. So, you know, lots of our, of our, of our customers who are recreational customers that I talked about that you know might just come for the, uh, the Super Bowl and, and may not place another bet until the following Super Bowl in March Madness or the NBA Finals. But we have to make sure we cater for that type of customer as well as your day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, probably a higher, higher bet count customer who's really interested in you know, MLB each, each and every day, tennis each and every day. And that's how we, we really have to make sure, and this is state by state, it can differ from, from average spend per head. So we make sure we cater for all, all types of customers when we acquire them and get as much knowledge about them so that we can put the best experience in front of them. Uh, I would just add to that, you know, we definitely see engagement as a, as a major opportunity in sports betting. I mean, going back to the op-ed that Commissioner wrote, um, we, we recognize that a lot of our fans are using sports betting as a way to engage with our product. And we've seen a lot of the data that suggests that fans that bet on sports, fans that play fantasy sports, they watch more games for longer periods of time. Um, and we think betting is a tool that help, can help us convert a casual fan into a core fan. You know, maybe a fan that was only watching their favorite team or tuning in for Warriors, Lakers, you know, now they have a reason to be interested in some of the other games that they might not have otherwise been interested in. And so um, we definitely see engagement as a, as a major piece here. And, um, you know, as Sarah mentioned earlier, it's not just getting folks to watch more games, but to continue to stay engaged with the game. There may be a game where in the third quarter or the fourth quarter, the outcome is no longer in doubt, but a lot of things remain in doubt. The, the final margin of victory, the over-under, various player totals. There's a lot of things that you're interested in other than just who wins the game. And so that opens up a lot of opportunity to further engage our fans, even in those games where perhaps the outcome is in a doubt. Just to add to, uh, to what Scott and Ray have said, uh, similar to Ray in terms of the composition of audience, it, it is certainly true that, um, you know, in, in the early days, so to speak, which I would say we are still in the early days as far as betting goes, uh, we have seen an older, um, you know, white male as our as our largest base that's betting. But when I think about you know the opportunity and the way the audience composition will shift and change, I actually think it is very similar to what we've seen across core sports insights as a whole. Which is that when you look at Gen Z, um, they're interested in teams, but their interest is really driven around players. And so to me, that says like, what are we doing with our props offers? Like, how are we infusing more? Um, you know, a, a wider range, of, a different set of products um, to really help affect what our uh, audience composition is. And that's where, you know, the, the partnerships here with both Ray and Scott become so important. We're thinking really intentionally about how we do that, because um, ultimately that really is the opportunity is to start getting really creative about, um, you know, what, why, why a fan chooses us. 
And Sarah, as I mentioned, my father and I, we've been running a Yahoo Fantasy Baseball team for several years. Are you seeing a lot of crossover in terms of those that are accessing your sports betting content or other the wider platform, as you mentioned, the importance of this getting, you know, consumers into the top of the funnel and have access to everything that Yahoo has to offer from a content perspective? Yeah, it, it's, um, well, first of all, thanks, Derek. Great job to you and your dad. Keep it up. Um, now we just need you on fantasy basketball and then you'll be good. Uh, we, <laughs> we, I think for fantasy, there, there are two parts to, to the Yahoo fantasy brand. The first is there's such a strong affinity for that brand. Um, and so that gives us an advantage where, you know, fans of sports, fans of fantasy have, have long time chosen us, have long time been playing with us, have long time had a good experience. The second piece is that that's where a lot of our fanatics and loyalists are. That's where we have the opportunity to constantly put, you know, news, information, updates um, in front of the audience. But on, on the flip side, our kind of core sports um, audience, you know, they are a big driver for consumption right now. And we think that's a huge opportunity. Um, and you know we'll we'll write a headline like uh, NBA better when turn six thousand into sixty thousand and betting on game six and that will just you know drive an, an incredible amount of traffic. So that does present an opportunity as we get a lot smarter um, in terms of how we partner with our marketing team. So as we mentioned, we're a little over the three years into this journey of the legalized sports betting landscape in the U.S. Just going around the horn, your know, observations, like what surprised you or not so much in terms of where we are at this point, the, the speed of adoption, how slow it's been related to states or consumers. What are some things that have surprised you over the last three years of where we are today with sports betting in the US? I can go first just because, and this is gonna sound very simple, but I've been surprised at how operators are, are skewing into kind of traditional sports media companies and how sports media companies are moving into the operator space and, and kind of strategies are merging together where we're kind of all mirroring each other. Um, so, you know, that uh, at the outset, I didn't think that would happen, but you know, when, when I'm following competition, just to be direct about it, like, I, I think it's interesting that there are tactics that are just about, Hey, let's just court a sports fan. It doesn't even need what we're posting, what we're writing, who we're partnering with. It doesn't need to necessarily have a betting or gaming angle. It just needs to be able to engage a sports fan. Yeah, Derek, from my side again, I it was strange because I, I obviously had my UK hat on. I'm going to move across here. The KPIs, the key metrics that I had in my head, you know, average spend per head, but the cost per acquisition and the bonus spend or promotional marketing spend, had these numbers. I had to quickly forget about them. And I give you a, a perfect example of that where the traditional sign-up offer in the UK market, even today, is traditionally around the, around the metric, metrics of place a five pound bet or five dollar bet, and we give you 20 pounds or $20 in return. You come here to the US and it's, my God, it's, it's exploded. And I know BetMGM is a key component of that as well, where you bet a dollar on a Lakers game and we'll give you a hundred dollars if LeBron makes a three-pointer. You know, it's, it's the value that it's never as good a time as to be a sports better here in the US. Um, you know, we've recently changed our risk-free bet up to a thousand dollars now. And it really is, does take me back sometimes when I look at $20 or 20 pounds that we were giving to a new customer in the UK market. Whereas here, and I, this will start to taper off, I'm, I'm certain, but the aggressiveness of the operators, including ourselves, to acquire new customers because it's so it's so fierce right now, as you can probably appreciate. If you're in a legalized state, you're going to be bombarded with sports betting, marketing, like bet MGMs. But it really is trying to, to, to get that customer to sign up and then to keep them. So that retention method is, is crucial. It's not just about getting them to make that deposit. But also then the cost per acquisition. So the cost... Again, I had to forget about my UK CPAs that I was so used to for five, six, seven, eight years, because the US, it, it really is that expensive to, 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 to get the customer, be it on sports or iGaming, and really makes that emphasis on early life cycle journey of a customer, making sure we make that, you know, Sarah talked about, that conversion funnel as, as barrier-less as possible, make it as seamless as you possibly can, so that it's easy for a consumer to, to do what they want to do. All they want to do is, is place a simple sports bet on their on their favorite team or their favorite player. So it really does. I've seen over the last two years how the US has really caught up quite aggressively when it comes to the product features that we're giving to a consumer. But the marketing spend and the promotional spend is still in a different stratosphere to what I've seen in the UK market. 
I'll give you one that surprised me to the upside and one that surprised me to the downside. Um, I would say I, I echo a bit of what Sarah said. And I, I'm surprised at how quickly betting has been welcomed by everyone in the sports media landscape. You know, we we were there obviously in 2014, and we knew that you know some would start to come along in 2018. But there is virtually no company in the sports media landscape that is opposed to sports betting or has not embraced it. And, and that happened, I think, a little bit more quickly. And 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 as Sarah said, not, not just embracing the category itself, but considering getting into the business directly, whether it be you know, taking equity stakes or considering being an operator, you know, media companies, teams and leagues have really jumped in with both feet. And, and that has happened awfully quickly. Um, on the other side, I, I've been surprised three years into the legislative discussion, how in so many of these states, we're still having the same conversations about in-person registration and only being in retail and restricting market access only to existing gaming license holders. You know, the, it's pretty clear from the early data that those markets that are pretty um, liberal in terms of more operators and you know, fewer restrictions and making it easier for the fan to access and having a lot of competition, they're yielding the best results. It's the best experience for the fan. It's the best for the operators. And, and I think early on, we were seeing a lot of protectionism in, in the various states of, hey, I, I'm, um, you know, I, I, I'm advantaged in this state, so I don't want these other companies in there. And I, I think we've now seen enough states unfold where operators, for the most part, know that what goes around comes around. And they may have some, some say in one state, but they may need a favor in the other one. Um, but it's been really slow, um, whether it be with state lotteries or tribal gaming or certain states that are headquartered in certain states. I've been surprised at how long it has taken everyone to get to the inevitability of we're going to have an open access where if you meet the requirements of a license, you can have a license, you can operate um, and you have full mobile competition. I think that's where it's all headed eventually. And the question is, how long is it going to take us to get there? And, and that's what's surprising. Yeah, it's a good point, Scott, because I think as we advise and look at brands that are concerned about whether or not they want to enter the sports betting landscape, I would agree with everyone on this panel. It's kind of an accepted part of, you know, the fabric of being a sports fan. And if anything, you know, the ability to do it in a safe and legalized fashion is a welcome relief, I think, for those states that are allowing that to happen. And I think you each brought up some good observations of how states could do that even more effectively. We've got a couple of questions that have come in from the panel. Uh, maybe, Scott, we'll start with you. One is, like, how much of this decisions related to sports betting is centralized at the league level and what sort of inputs do the teams have in the evolution of sports betting within the NBA? Sure, we have guidelines that our team has to follow, uh, our teams have to follow, and that, that spans across our whole business. Um, you know, there are guidelines that teams have to follow. You know, our teams, you know, we've been studying this issue for seven years, you know, myself and the folks at legal, and we have a deep expertise in understanding the marketplace and understanding how market access works and what's legal in one state and not and how you can structure different agreements. So I think it's helpful to advise our teams on on what's appropriate and what's not. But from within those guidelines, they're free to partner, you know, with they're free to pick their partner. So we have we have teams that are partnering with um, you know FanDuel and DraftKings and MGM. We have we have teams that are partnering with local casinos that are running things more locally. Um, and then we have, you know, we really run the gamut in terms of the type of partnership. We have companies that are basically just buying camera visible signage and that's it. And they just want to be, have a presence in the broadcast and that's all they're looking for. To the other end of the spectrum where because of a unique law that exists in DC, there's actually a sports book in Capital One Arena in DC. Uh, there's, a, there's a Caesars William Hill sports book in that arena and there will be a sports book in the Suns Arena next year. And MGM announced uh, earlier this week they're going to be operating a sports book at the Cardinals Stadium in, in Arizona. So, um, you know, we provide the guidelines. Um, and then, of course, the, the teams have to operate under the legal requirements of that state. So what the Suns are doing and what the Wizards are doing, um, that is because the law allows them to do that. In most states, that's not the case. And the teams can have sponsorship, but they can't have a sports book on site because of the way the gaming licenses were issued. Um, but we do allow the teams to make their own decisions and who they want to partner with. Um, but there are guidelines that, that we set that they have to follow. Makes sense. Sandra, this one, next one's for you, for each of you. Um, you know, we've seen 
DraftKings making deals with online gaming assets to expand, potentially Fnatic getting into that space. Does that tie lift all boats? Is competition healthy for you guys from a content and operator perspective in the world of sports betting? Uh, yeah, I think I think the you know one of the key insights that we focused on from the start is one of the main ways betters make their decision is the strength of a promo or the strength of an offer. Um, and I certainly think competition is good because we work hard with BetMGM to make sure our products and our promos are very compelling um, and allow our user to choose us. So uh, I, I ultimately think that's probably a good thing. It also helps um, just drive awareness for betting as a whole. Yeah, um, yeah. every single day we, we look at what our competitors are doing to make sure we're, we're relevant, um, which we almost certainly are. I think for us, it does help when we're somewhat collaborative with so the user in New York, how we're, we're going in as, as, as a partner, if you like, with DraftKings or Banjo. Um, but when it comes to, as Sarah's alluded to, making to ourselves better, and making sure that we offer the best in class, sure whether if you look at our iGaming platform right now, we're number one in the US because we've got the best in class iGaming platform. Overall, we're number two, and that's exactly where we're really trying to get to that number one spot. So the proposition that we give to our consumer, as, as I mentioned before, it really needs to be that very much best in class. And of course, we look at what the promotional cadence of many of our competitors are. It's not just fans with DraftKings. There's many more that are coming in almost on a daily basis, it seems. Um, but we're very comfortable and confident that what we can offer is a bit is very much unique to what our competitors can do. So I talk about our omni-channel experience. So we have MGM properties across the nation, obviously heavily dominated in Vegas. But we really feel we have that secret sauce to, to make us stand out from our competitors. You know, make it so once you're in our MGM property placing a bet in the bet MGM sportsbook, you have that seamless experience with the app as well. So that's our, if you like, secret sauce that we were leaning into. And that's despite the fact, you know, the challenges we've obviously had with properties over the last 12, 18 months. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an extremely competitive market. I'm seeing the likes of New Jersey, which is very similar to the UK in terms of the number of operators, whereas other states, are a little bit more in their infancy, but it's, um, yeah, it's never dull, Derek, any sir. Yeah, and from our work with uh, your teams, totally agree with that perspective. MGM really has a unique opportunity in sense of not just being a leader in terms of the sports betting experience, but that overall end-to-end -end as a great destination leisure and travel resort is something that's unique in the space as we talk about, about sports betting. So we got about five minutes left. One more question um, for, for the team. We're almost four years into this journey. The next three to five years, what types of things or innovations do you expect to see in sports betting for the consumer from a content operator or league perspective um, as the as the industry continues to mature? What I hope to see um, is that there's a whole new crop of, of voices, of creators that kind of flips the mold for who's making the, the big money. Um, from a talent standpoint, I think that, you know, sports media has favored the big national voice, national perspective. And I think and hope that because of the nature of, of uh, the way, you know, betting legislation is working, that, that actually regional opinions, regional mm -hmm. voices are become incredibly influential, influential in, um, you know, cultivating regional fan bases. And ultimately, uh, helping helping support, helping drive awareness of of gaming products. So that's we'll see. I, I don't know if I'm going to be right or wrong, but I I actually think that's a huge opportunity for all the all of the uh, content creators out there. It's a great observation because you've all talked about you know the importance of one on one marketing for the sports better. That's surely would seem to apply with that lens in this in this space as well. Um, on my side, and obviously Ray, not to put you on the spot, here, but um, I'm hoping to see a lot more product innovation in, in the space. Um, you know, I, something Ray said earlier is something we agree with uh, pretty strongly that to a casual fan, they open up a betting app and they just see a lot of pluses and minuses and, it, and it's really overwhelming. And how do we create a, a more interactive, simpler, more intuitive experience for betting on our games there? that you don't need a degree in advanced calculus to, to understand. Um, and, you know, we have not seen a lot of product innovation to date. I, I give the operators a break in that when you have to get up and running in every new state and comply with each new state's regulations, you, you just have to get live. Um, but hopefully as the 
pace of new states starts to slow and the critical mass is there, um, we'll start to see more innovation in the product. And that fan experience of, you know, like you said, Ray, you know, I think LeBron's going to score a lot of points. What do I do with that? And not have to search through a menu of pluses and minuses to try to figure out what that means for his over under. Um, and, and that's where I, I do think we will, we will start to see it over the next few years. And I think that will really create more engagement opportunities with the casual fan that isn't familiar with betting. And we'll probably speak more to the sort of millennial Gen Z fan that didn't grow up in Vegas with an odds board with, with pluses and minuses. Yeah, Scott stole my thunder a little bit, but he's absolutely spot on. Um, we did a piece of research in the UK market just before I, I made move across asking consumers what they wanted. What was their number one reason that they picked Bookmaker X or, or Sportsbook X over Sportsbook Y? And it was app speed and ease. So that was number one. It was all about the product, making it as, as easy, as, as quick for me to place a bet and as easy for me to place a bet. When you we replicated something similar here in the US market right now, it seems to be skewing more towards the Sarah's loom to the biggest promotion, the biggest welcome offer, the you know the, the proposition in terms of prices. I, I think our product and Scott's absolutely right. We need to we're making significant um, strides. As I said, it is night and day to where it was two years ago. I, I, I anticipate in the next eighteen months it's going to be it's going to take another step change to make it just to make our app as quick as it possibly can so that. I won't even call it half a second. It's actually quicker than that, that we need to make sure that when a customer loads up our uh, the BetMGM app, we give the quickest and most easiest experience to them in order to place the bet. Because we talk a lot about you know, driving people from placing their pre, pre-match bet into the in-play. And as Scott alluded to, certainly in, in basketball, where it's you know, a score every couple of seconds, we need to, we need to make, make sure the, the app is, is up to speed with that. So I think the evolution, uh, Derek, you speak about is our consumers are going to demand, and rightly so, that we have the very best, the quickest application to make sure their betting experience is is the absolute max. I, I do feel that that reliance on promotions and free bets and bonuses as a sign up will start to dissipate when consumers have maybe three or four different sportsbooks apps, you know, be it ourselves and some of our competitors. They'll then go, well, what now differentiates the two of them or the three or four of them? And brand plays a huge role in all that, but also the speed and ease of your app is going to become ever more important. And I talk about ourselves and, and the omnichannel experience is it's, it's a key focus for us to make sure that when you go from property to, to, to online and vice versa, it is very much that seamless experience. So there are key focuses as we go forward into, into the next couple of years. And would you see it might be possible if those things are true, we may get to a point where there's full in-game live betting on that point. The latency obviously is critical. You guys have made a great observation. Certain sports are more conducive to that, but could we get there across all sports um, at some point? Yeah, I think tennis is probably the one example of where I, I see 90% of our of our bets or handle is actually in play in tennis. So it is all about, Derek, as you alluded to, the, the next point, the next game or the next match, um, who, who's going to win the next point, who's going to win the next game. And I think sports like NBA is, or basketball is absolutely perfect for that. It's, we need to make sure we have a platform, the feed to make sure we, we keep up with such a thing. And other sports like you know NFL is very much there, but golf in particular, I think the future of, of in-play golf is very interesting, exciting, where you have Rory McIlroy you know, st- um, standing on the tee. Will he hit fairway, you know, uh, rough or, or semi-rough? Th- that's really interesting and compelling of, of the potential future of giving the consumer just much more interesting and compelling betting opportunities as opposed to just who's going to win the tournament. Who- 